Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us on this lovely Wednesday. Um, today we are hosting this webinar, um, GMP Certification for Cannabis and Hemp. We have tips, case studies, and where to start. Uh, my name is Amy Wayne. I'm a marketing team member for PJRFSI, and I'm just going to be in the background facilitating and helping out if there's any technical difficulties along the way. Uh, but today presenting, we have first uh, Brett McMillan, who is a project manager and manager of, of our uh, cannabis and hemp program here at PJRFSI. So Brett, if you want to take it away, it's all yours. Great. Thanks, Amy. Good afternoon, everybody. Here to talk about GMP certification for cannabis and hemp. And as the title says, we've got some great tips, case studies, and ideas of where to start. Um, also, uh, very excited to have on the line David Valancourt, who's the founder and senior consultant for the GMP Collective. And looking forward to also getting his uh, input and also his presentation. Uh, just a couple introductory items. Um, we are also going to put out a few polling questions. There's going to be a total of four. And the first one's going to come up in the next uh, couple slides. And that gives us an idea of how you, the audience, are determining your needs, where you're coming from, if you're a grower, if you're a producer, uh, maybe a quality manager. And that way we can uh, kind of help dictate where the discussions and, and some of the questions go. Um, so we'll launch one of those here shortly. I'm going to click through some of our slides and just introduce ourselves here. And let's see if we can get the first one to click through. David, are you able to click through on your end? There we go. That's me. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, great. So who is Perry Johnson? Why are we you know, hosting this webinar? We are a family of companies, uh, starting with Perry Johnson Registrars, which is a globally recognized certification body for numerous ISO standards. Uh, we have offices, obviously, here in the United States. Our headquarters are in Troy, Michigan, and we have other offices around the globe. And we are an accrediting, excuse me, accredited certification body, meaning we have been audited by folks that come visit us uh, as to our competency to award certification to you. Uh, we also have our Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety Division, which handles numerous types of food safety manufacturing certifications, uh, also GMP, Good Agricultural Practices, USDA Organic, and other uh, programs that we're gonna get into more detail here in a bit. So let's talk about food safety and how it implies here to our hemp and cannabis program. Right now, I think David would also uh, confer that, you know, right now it is a little bit of a wild west, especially with uh, growers of cannabis. State by state, the regulations are different. And by having different programs in place that are industry recognized, like good manufacturing practices, uh, organic for hemp, different types of ISO certifications can help keep everybody uh, on track and also keep it uh, symmetrical from state to state and from company to company. What are the responsibilities of the various producers? Obviously, things need to be grown and manufactured in a safe uh, manner. Uh, controls need to be implemented to make sure those things are being done correctly. And obviously, you need to get the whole company on board. Sometimes instituting these changes and these new programs can have a little bit of pushback. And uh, usually everyone you know, needs to get on the bus and needs to be on board to make these changes. There's all kinds of different regulatory responsibilities. There's federal, there's state, there's local. Uh, there are globally recognized food safety standards that come into play. And depending on what state you're in and, and what you're growing, cannabis or hemp, uh, obviously there's going to be some different types of uh, certifications involved and also different types of, unfortunately, uh, enforcement programs in terms of testing how things are being produced and how recalls and things like that are managed.
So we're going to be providing the audits, the certifications uh, outside of the regulatory requirements because we are a, a private third party for that certification. So based on different sets of food safety standards like GMPs or HACCP, different companies can acquire and achieve these uh, certifications by going through those audits. In terms of hemp and cannabis regulation, and I know uh, David's going to um, talk about this here in a little bit, obviously hemp and cannabis, they've turned into two different divisions. Um, a lot of this was, I think, socially kind of clumped together. And I think anybody that's on this call would understand that uh, hemp and cannabis are two different crops, obviously, two different sets of chemicals, two different industries, and they're uh, obviously being regulated uh, differently on a federal level and on a state level. The types of regulation vary by state. Uh, a lot of the states have turned in their hemp programs to the feds to be reviewed. Some states require accredited testing of the product. Some states do not. For instance, Texas uh, requires 17025 accreditation for testing labs uh, that are testing hemp for potency and also for any other uh, microbials. In terms of testing, uh, which is one of the divisions under the Perry Johnson umbrella, Perry Johnson lab accreditation accredits testing laboratories to what's called the ISO 17025 standard. The 17025 standard is what is mandated by most states if you want to get a testing license for marijuana in your state. For instance, California, Michigan, Illinois, Massachusetts. If you want to have a license to test marijuana, you have to become 17025 accredited. And by achieving that, you're showing the state and, your, and the world in general that your lab is capable of detecting those things that are important to cannabis and hemp in terms of the potency, residual solvents, microbial pathogens, possible contamination, uh, things of that level. The different types of audits and certifications you can get, uh, obviously there's good agricultural practices known as GAP, and there's gonna be quite a few acronyms here. Um, there is cannabis good manufacturing practices, GMP, and you can also do that for hemp. There's hazard analysis and critical control points, HACCP, which is a basically a crossover from the food industry, and that philosophy has been around for many, many years. And then there's what are called GFSI benchmarked audits. Uh, GFSI stands for Global Food Safety Initiative. And for callers, excuse me, for listeners, participants that aren't really familiar with GFSI, that is the top level most robust level of certification that a food producer can achieve. So if you want to distribute your products to the bigger players in the world, the Walmarts, the Costcos, the Trader Joes, et cetera, uh, at some point in the process, they're going to require that you have a food safety certification that is recognized by GFSI. And some of the larger hemp producers, and who knows, eventually cannabis producers, may be required to have some of these or invest in those programs. Uh, for cannabis GMP, which David's gonna get into here in a little bit, uh, this can cover any company in any state, and quite frankly, really in a lot of different countries, which David will discuss here shortly. Uh, some states in terms of cannabis GMP specifically may have different requirements concerning GMP and what needs to be reviewed. Some of them may have no requirements at all. But the fact that any one producer or any one grower achieves GMP is always going to be a positive thing and is always going to add to whatever the state requires. In terms of certifications and how you can achieve this on our end, this roadmap uh, slide basically goes over the process. You know, you need to get the management on board to become certified to whatever program you choose to join. Uh, you need to get your documentation together. You need to do an internal audit on yourself to make sure you're meeting the requirements of whatever standard you choose to go through. And once that process is done, those corrective actions and those things that have come out of the wash from the audit are reviewed. And once those are 
uh, answered by our team here with the auditor. Your certificate is uh, issued to you and that is renewed annually. Why get certified? Right, right now, a lot of people may be in a holding pattern or our state is not requiring this right now, what have you. Obviously, this shows that your company is committed to producing a quality product and also in a safe way for the end user, be it hemp, CBD, THC, what have you. So uh, there's market awareness by gaining certification. Also, you can meet the requirements of any state requirements. And also in the public eye, it's gonna set your company above other products and other companies that aren't necessarily doing this. One of the companies we've had the pleasure of working with who's gone through the GMP process and is just actually about to finish up their GA, or GAP, Good Agricultural Practices, is MedFarm Technologies. They're out of Denver. And they have embraced the system. Uh, we were able to work with them and do a custom GMP certification, which also focused on the requirements of the state of Colorado. And in working with them, became the backbone of our cannabis and hemp GMP checklist, uh, which is now basically an industry standard for achieving GMP. And so we're, any of the MedFarm team is out there, we're uh, definitely grateful for working with you guys. So this next slide, David. Um, David's worked with numerous companies to assist them with GMP. As you can see from the slide, uh, he's been around the block with ISO auditing and assisting other companies. And I'd like to kind of hand things over to David right now. And maybe in doing so, we can do our uh, first polling question. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, here, I'll get our first poll started, which um, is how is your GMP program right now? And let me see here. Launch it. Everybody should be able to see that if you want to go ahead and, and uh, answer that. And then we'll, we'll kind of share the results with everybody to see where you're all at. Um, in the meantime, I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, thank you, Brett, and the rest of the Perry Johnson team. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, some of my roles, I, in addition to being the founder and uh, president and senior uh, consultant here at the GMP Collective, I've got a team of folks backed in pharma, food, medical devices, and dietary that work with folks like Perry Johnson and, and their clients to make sure that they're set up for success. Um, I'm actively involved both in NCIA, the National Cannabis Industry Association. I serve on the Facility Design Committee and we're driving some standardization and best practice guidance documents for the industry. Also work on ASTM as an officer and volunteer there. The ASTM International has a Standards Development Committee. Uh, they're an international uh, standards development group, 120 years old, and I work on the, serve on the laboratory subcommittee there. So. I've seen quite a bit. Uh, we work throughout North America, in addition to the US, uh, Canada and Columbia are countries we've worked in. And um, GMPs, uh, as I hope you'll see, are more than just a stamp, more than just uh, market access, but it's really a great best practice and provides significant value to your company. Um, looks like we've got a good amount of votes, so let me close the poll here. Um, and let's see, share. So, <clears throat> Folks should be able to see the results there. Um, looks like we've got a good, about a fifth of the folks here have nothing in place but need to move forward. That's great. Um, you got to start somewhere, so I'm, I'm appreciative to hear that you know you acknowledge that. And um, you know we have GMP already, another fifth that are trying to learn more. And then uh, looks like about three fifths of the folks are somewhere else in the sphere. So that's great. And um, to the folks that wherever none of the above falls. Uh, hopefully you'll find some, I trust you'll find some value in this. Um, let me move ahead here. So what is uh, the objectives that I want to get across here? There's kind of three main things and that could really be boiled down to um, one thing. And hold on one second, let me just make sure that we've got the poll closed. Here, oh, hide. Okay, 
fantastic. So, you know, there's three main objectives, what GMP is and it's not, because that's a lot of, uh, that can be a complicated misnomer in terms, uh, the value of GMPs and really where to begin, which you could really boil it down to, done right, this is best practices for your business that will make you more profitable, lucrative, and successful, both with product quality and um, patience and you know, shareholder happiness. So what are GMPs? Um, they can be defined as, and this is by the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers. It's quite a mouthful, but you'll see a couple of acronyms. Don't worry about them too much today. Good manufacturing practices are a system for ensuring that products are consistently produced and controlled according to quality standards. I'd uh, ask anyone to argue with the fact that that's not important. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty fundamental and important. What's the C? that really just stands for current. So you'll see a lot of regulations in the federal sphere that talks about CGMPs, and that just means that you're going to stay current as technology um, and best practices evolve to be at the forefront of uh, what allows you to provide that consistent and controlled quality and safe products. I wanna talk about the, three, the other three Cs that folks hear quite a bit, and you'll see either in you know, press releases, um, in quarterly reports, uh, et cetera, and it can be very confusing. So to conform, there's conform, comply, and certify. When you conform, essentially that's saying that you fulfill a requirement, but it's more of a self-certification. Um, I could raise my hand and say, David Valancourt conforms to, you know, the ability to drive my vehicle on the road, but that's self-certifying. <clears throat> complying is saying that you are fulfilling a requirement typically on the legal side, and complying can form can uh, kind of be used interchangeably. The, dis the difference though with the third C is certification, and that's saying, you know, I'm certified to actually drive on the road. Some sort of independent body has given me the authority, and that's where we look at folks like Perry Johnson. So it's an att attestation of conformance or compliance by that independent third body. And that's really what gives this weight and legs and allows you to differentiate yourselves. Brett kind of touched on this briefly. Um, what are some of the benefits of conforming to GMPs? Uh, as the name says, you know, focuses on product quality and patient consumer safety. Uh, we're in the business of providing quality to our patients uh, through consistent, safe products. Uh, that's our lifeblood. So GMP is kind of a, you know, just a common sense starter there. Um, it allows efficiency, standardization, and repeatable quality by design. And GMP is all about standardization, and that's what allows you to drive efficiency. At the same token, uh, things can start getting into, say, Lean and Six Sigma. Um, there's a lot of relation there that you start with with GMPs, and it allows you to reduce your waste. <laughs> Uh, GMPs also ensure traceability, which from a management level is very valuable in terms of um, you want to understand where you're at and where your products are at and control your supply chain and know that if something went wrong, you can dial back to where did things go wrong. You have full traceability uh, and visibility into your operation. Um, th th this all kind of combines to provide tangible evidence of quality and safety, which again, if you didn't write it down, if you didn't do it, uh, you know, it's not documented, it didn't happen. So how do you prove to your consumers, the third parties, to, you know, your board that you have done things correctly? <laughs> it provides that. And then finally, you know, and we'll get into this a little bit, you know, export opportunities. It provides you with a baseline, as Brett was referencing with, say, the GFSI certifications for food, to get into the Trader Joe's, the Whole Foods, to get into the external and, uh, you know, um, international marketplace. <laughs> so I wanted to show this, uh, start off with kind of this image of, you know, food and ag and spices. Um, how do you get, say, um, inner bark or you know the inner part of the cinnamon uh, verm tree the cinnamon tree that's there pictured in the top left into that great little simply organic cinnamon that you might get at your local grocery store same with uh, black peppercorns there's a global standard for that and it actually revolves around um, it's a codex alimentarius it's put together by the world health organization and the food and ag uh, org of the united nations there's a standard for that it's been around for several decades and it's the code of hygienic practice practice. Use that and keep that in the back of your mind because that's one tool and resource to look at in terms of making sure you have best practices in place. <laughs> On the food side, which is where the Perry Johnson certification scheme comes in place, um, part 117 here of the Code of Federal Registra 
code of federal regulations, and again, this is a mouthful because we're dealing with fund government agencies, um, it's current good manufacturing practices, hazard analysis, and risk-based preventative controls for human food. Um, so there are standards for this uh, that can be adopted to uh, cannabis. Same in the dietary natural products. Um, there's same 21 CFR, just uh, part 111, and that's your current good manufacturing practices for dietary supplements. And then uh, without going too deeply into all them, there are several other GMPs. So we like to talk about it as, think of it as flavors of GMP. So you've got your um, pharma GMPs, your cosmetics, and medical devices are other predominant, uh, very common GMPs in the world. So that said, what is GMP? And, and if there's anything that you take away, um, I found GMP to be a buzzword for good or for bad. Um, perhaps it's what got you guys here to listen and interested, so you wanted to learn more. Um, Think of it as best practices for your business. Uh, so there's the magic GMP triangle that I like to talk about, and it involves personnel and organization. I intentionally put that at the top because as you saw in Brett's, uh, one of his earlier slides, management commitment is key. Without that, we don't have anything. You need the personnel on board, you need the organization in order, you need job descriptions, and you need order. <laughs> Um, you need materials and processes to be controlled. Again, how do you know that your product is safe if you don't know where your raw material is coming from and you're getting it from five different vendors that have no proof of similarity? Um, you know, one set of, you know, there's different olive oil grades out there. Making sure that you know which kind of material and which specification and grade you're going to is really important and to be able to have documented proof of that. Same thing on your processes. And then, you know, the third um, part of that triangle is your equipment in rooms and your entire facility as a whole. So making sure that it's qualified, making sure that you have adequate storage space and documented evidence that you've actually thought through that. So I'll dive a little bit deeper into the personnel and organization side. You know, training is important. How do we know how to produce things standard uh, in a standard way? I like to tell folks, I want you to be able to go on vacation as, you know, a supervisor, manager, or, you know, just more, if you're more than one person that does a certain process, be on vacation at the beach in Bermuda and not have to worry about a phone call at 8 p.m. on a Thursday night where I don't know how to fix this machine because I wasn't trained on it and I need you to help me. There needs to be a process for that. Um, certainly exceptions happen, but make sure there's training in place so folks know what to do and they can do it consistently while you're out on vacation. Uh, that aligns with adherence to procedures. Make sure you actually have procedures. <laughs> and then make sure that you have a good quality system that connects all of these dots together to be able to provide evidence and show continuous improvement. <laughs> On the equipment and rooms, a couple of questions you want to ask yourself. Are they adequate? You know, um, does it, uh, do you need negative air controls or positive pressure? <laughs> um, what kind of, you know, is it easily cleanable? What's your surface? What's your walls look like? What's the lighting? Um, is it reliable? You know, is your equipment going to break down all the time? That may not allow you to achieve your objectives. Um, you know, you can follow Murphy's Law and um, have things fail when you least expect it or don't want them to on, uh, again, say a Thursday night before you have to get a massive shipment out Friday morning. Um, is the equipment in rooms qualified? Um, you know, it's kind of like you know, cars that come off the assembly line. They don't just say, oh, it works, trust me, <clears throat> go take it and drive 90 miles an hour down the highway. You qualify that the brakes work first and do a, you know, do a safety check. Same thing with your equipment. You're, you know, you're investing in something that's supposed to help you produce multiple millions of dollars of product in a given year or perhaps a month. You want to make sure that it works first before you start sprinting. Because if it's not, then you have the time and opportunity to fix it and correct it before it's too late. And then finally, again, back to best practices. Can you prove it? Um, we it, it can't just take your word for it, but we need to have tangible evidence that you've done all that. Which again, helps you in your business at, at say a senior level to say, oh, I've got the evidence to know that you know Tyrell or Brett was actually um, on track with doing what they said. <laughs> They're not just paying me lip service. Last uh, third part of that triangle, right? We've got materials and processes. Are the materials adequate? Are they of a specified quality? Are they of you know specified or the correct quality? Defining what that means in terms of residual solvents or purity or color is very important and uh, you know kind of fundamental to make sure that uh, you know a square is a square is a square. <clears throat> um, 
uh, are your materials and your processes validated? Have you verified them, whether it's through an additional you know, third-party testing, whether it's through running tests internally or doing some sort of visual checks? <laughs> Again, can you prove it? Do you have documentation of this? <laughs> so um, before I jump into the common mistakes here, I'd like to ask uh, the question of, you know, what does your system need help with most? <laughs> um, so for folks that perhaps are in this place, uh, are operating a business, are interested in GMPs, let us know, is it you know, documentation that you think is, is weakest? Is it your physical process? Is it all, is it overall? Or is it um, you're great, none of the above? <laughs> so I'll give you folks a few, uh, few seconds to finish that up. And by a few seconds, I'll give you about 10 more. All right, let's uh, get the countdown go. Three, two, one, last chance. Sorry, it looks like a couple of folks got something in it right at the very end there. Thank you. Um, so great. Um, the third, none of the above, either you're outside of the realm of um, maybe you don't have a GMP facility or in the manufacturing space or um, you're, you're set up, you're dialed, you're good to go. And if that's the case, I commend you. Um, overall review, that makes a lot of sense. Um, perhaps one over the other uh, is hard to say. And uh, I find it um, great and interesting that the 14% that the documentation physical process review is um, is equivalent there. So, um, you know, best, best way to say is let's just start with an overall review and look at some of your weakest links, <clears throat> the low hanging fruit and work on those to improve. Uh, thanks for all your uh, input guys. So what do we find that are the most common mistakes in the world? Um, and this, uh, some of this information actually comes from World Health Organization studies that were done in developing countries in the pharmaceutical world. So the reality is we're not all that different. We're all in the same boat of having some sort of struggles and challenges. Um, the top mistakes uh, tend to be facility and equipment based, raw materials handling, and quality control, um, which, you know, kind of comes back to your physical processes um, and uh, your documentation, which is all intertwined, especially on the quality control side. Uh, and then the last one that I threw out there that's especially prevalent in, um, in the cannabis space is, is purchasing SOPs online. And I think that goes back to your, speaks to the documentation. So on the facility and equipment side, you know, you wanna look at things like <clears throat> making sure that your equip, your room is fit for purpose. Um, do you have a change room in place? How are folks actually segregating their, um, you know, their street clothes from their PPE um, where appropriate? And that's to say that, you know, full PPE Tyvek suits are not necessary in every area. You can take a smart approach and base, let the data drive you in terms of where are your highest risks? Where do you need to have the most amount of PPE to go into certain areas. Um, but it all starts with having a change room. So you have that basic layer of safety and hygiene. Um, adequate storage is probably the biggest thing that we see where folks just underestimate the storage in a build out and you end up having final products stored with raw materials and you're not a, not a being able to follow FIFO, you know, first in, first out, and you just have no control over your inventory and it makes for a mess. Um, when I watch and see, say, seven packaging people sitting around for three hours because they didn't realize they were short of some material, uh, whether it's you know glassware or caps or filler, uh, you know filler ingredients, because it was stashed in the back and they thought they had it and it got it disappeared. You know that's real time and money lost and efficiency. So having adequate storage is you know again it's GMP, but it's also just best practices to allow your business to be more efficient. And then what's the cleanability of it? Uh, if you can't easily clean it and it's a critical component that needs to be cleaned, um, that, that's also an issue. So uh, starting at the design phase is really important. <clears throat> and with raw materials, again, specifications. Um, start with some sort of specifications that you want your vendors or raw, you know, raw material suppliers to be able to provide you with um, and be able to show that they can meet it, whether it's color, viscosity, you know, percentage of residual solvents, et cetera. Um, are those ingredients safe? You know, kind of a basic check there. 
Uh, we look back to the vaping crisis some. Nobody wants to be uh, that person that was responsible for injuring or, you know, worst case, uh, leading to somebody's death. Um, that's what will sink a company uh, in many ways. So make sure that your ingredients are safe. Do that basic check. Um, and that all comes back to a supplier qualification program. And it can be a very simple one pager to start with, with a questionnaire that you ask your, your, um, your supplier some basic questions. Um, and the government, you know, Brett alluded earlier to ISO. ISO 9001, if you don't have an ISO 9001 quality system, um, most situations, you want to do government contract work, that's the basis. So, um, you know, you need to have some sort of attestation. And that comes back to the same, you know, Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. They're going to look at, they're going to qualify you. They're going to make sure that you have some certain ducks in a row. Um, you should be doing the same down to your supply chain. With quality control, um, whether you're doing this internally in-house or you're required to in, you know, in the cannabis space to send it out to a third-party testing lab, what are the specifications they're testing against? If your state doesn't require it, ask your individual testing lab. They should provide you with the LOQ and you know, the testing um, you know, reporting thresholds. Um, are your samples representative? I've seen, you know, there's, a, there's a common term of cherry picking. Um, that can, you know, there's reasons why folks want to do that, but that's not allowed. You have to have a representative sample, and you want to have a representative sample to know that you're producing a product that's actually consistent within a certain degree of specification. Uh, so how are you uh, getting to that? Um, what questions are you asking? How are you doing your sampling plan? And really, um, you know, a lot of folks, and again, I I don't blame the cannabis space. I've, I like to push it back on regulators and say, the regulators have set a lot of the cannabis folks up for failure because they require final product testing and that's it. And when you look at any other industry, you're doing smart checks along the way because you don't wanna just, you know, play, you know, sprint and then pray that your, your product passes the final testing. Um, wouldn't it be great to know before you've spent all that time and labor for say $500,000 worth of batch material that there's something wrong before you send it to final testing? Um, so be smart about your testing and we can help devise smart strategic testing schemes that are, you know, again, work smarter, not harder. And of course, the safety of raw materials. Um, Standard operating procedures, I kind of alluded that to um, a bit ago, and before I jump into these, I'd love to just ask one more question, which is, how is your documentation set up? <laughs> so, open the poll for perhaps one last time, and uh, let me know, how's your documentation in place? Um, do you have nothing in place right now? Do you have spreadsheets and basic procedures? Do you have a software program, um, or are you somewhere outside of all of that. And I'll tell you a lot of this, um, there's no right or wrong answer, of course. Uh, a lot of this really depends on where you're at in your operation, how big and, and complicated and sophisticated you are. So I'll give folks about three more seconds uh, and we'll close out. Uh, three, two, one, going, going, gone. <laughs> all right, thanks everybody. So. Looks like about 40%, almost half have uh, nothing in place right now. And, and uh, perhaps by nothing in place, I'd like to think that you have maybe a binder or some sort of you know documents printed out somewhere. Maybe you don't even know where they are. Um, I've, I've seen that before, that wouldn't surprise me, it, it happens. And um, you know, you have spreadsheets and basic procedures. That's fantastic. You know, some sort of you know, traceability, and with spreadsheets, you can actually, you know, you can you can work with that data, and you can actually analyze it and look at things uh, much more efficiently than if you know you're having to thumb through paper records. <laughs> and then uh, I'd love to talk more about the folks that have the software program in place already, because um, you're you're definitely ahead of the curve, and that's you know, that's going to allow you to be efficient and scale, uh, and really reduces. When you're in an audit, uh, typically, especially on an FDA side, you've got maybe 15 minutes to get them what they're what they're looking for. So you want to be able to, you know, with a software system, it's really easy to pull that out. So you know, kind of getting back to SOPs, there, I, um, these are living documents. And uh, you know, when I made that mention of one of the biggest issues we find is folks just purchase their SOPs in a bundle. Um, you know, these need to be these need to speak for you and what your business does. So, you know, yes, it needs to, you need to be able to show that you meet the regulatory requirements, but 
if they're getting dusty out in the corner of your lab and your your frontline workers don't use them or they just they just don't resonate with them because they're maybe written to to uh, I don't know complicated or you know they don't speak to actually what those folks do then they're not real and they're not valuable so you know who developed them they should be developed by a team especially the folks that use them day to day this is a tool to help them, not as a compliance fail safe. Um, and that's what we see a lot of folks, again, I come back to a lot of folks, a lot of uh, uh, states and even the countries, uh, say country of Canada requires you to send all of your SOPs together during your license application process. So I'll give you guys credit, you're kind of set up for failure in that regard. Um, it's that's That's a requirement, I get it, for the license. But once you go operational, go back, their living documents, review them, revise them, and make sure they reflect reality. And then make sure you have your quality team to manage them. That way you can actually see that they're effective and you can start measuring the level of effectiveness based on you know, KPIs and operational outputs that you wanna be tracking to make sure that your process is continuous and consistent. Um, let's see here. So, you know, all that said, you know, when and where should I begin? Um, depending on where you're at in this journey, you know, you want to begin with the end in mind. So when I say that, I, what I mean is, what's your final products? What are you producing? Are you producing, you know, perhaps you're a cultivator and you're just producing raw flour that's going to get sent off to, you know, your local dispensary for purchase to buy as, you know, whole flour or perhaps you're going to extract it. Well, depending on which way you're going to go, that means that can make a significant difference in how you construct your facility, how your layout, the amount of storage you need, the amount of PPE, um, the level of complexity of you know, engineers and staffing requirements. So you know, start with the end in mind and work from there. Start at the design phase. Um, you, know, you wanna look at, this is an example from the pharmaceutical side, but you may have to have airlocks. You may have to have different pressure gradients to ensure that during, say, a more sterile, you know, an encapsulation process or powder, you know, when you're when you're doing some sort of, yeah, when you're doing encapsulation, that all the dust and powder that's being emitted and spewed out is being contained. Um, looking at that is very important and must be done at the design phase. It's a lot easier and cheaper to do then than uh, once you're operational and have to retrofit a uh, HVAC system for a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, so, all right, well, that that's all great and fine, David, but um, what if I'm already operational? Uh, a little too late for that. It's not too late. Um, your business depends on this, I would argue, uh, for all of the benefits that we've mentioned earlier. So it's never too late. Start with a gap audit of your operation. Um, just like when you looked at that roadmap, you, know, you select your registrar, now you've got management commitment, now do an internal audit. Audit early, audit often. Uh, in the case of just getting started when you're for the GMP road, despite being already operational, focus on your structural and physical components first, because those are the things that can be deal breakers. Um, that said, there's almost always ways to get creative in terms of PPE and process and systems that you can put in place uh, without having to you know, start from scratch and put a bulldozer uh, wrecking ball to it. So focus on that first, know what you've got, know what you can live with, know what you can modify, and then build your system uh, from there <clears throat> and be prepared for a GMP audit. Um, select the right GMP certification scheme. So, you know, we're here, this is Perry Johnson's group, right? The beauty of you know, talking about CFR 117 for food is that this certification scheme allows you to have an independent set of eyes come in and say, we are awesome. We are company X and we are awesome. Instead of raising my hand and saying, I self-certify, uh, you know, self-attest self that I conform. <laughs> You want to be company specific uh, and, and determining your certification scheme. Um, you know, there's a different fit for everybody. Um, you may not be the same one size fits all. So figure that out, <clears throat> define where your values are, what level of GMP you want to um, achieve. Uh, look at your customers, right? Make sure that you're meeting the demand of what your customers require. If you're doing medical pharmaceutical grade, that's a little bit different than you know adult use. So 
you you want to take those into consideration and the beauty of you know this uh the 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 safety uh the safety standard for manufacturing scheme is that it has some of that flexibility built in so start with that and uh you know because the reality is there is a lack of federal oversight and there's no you know food gmp program that the fda is going to come in and say here follow 117 to the letter and we'll certify you or you know approve you we have to look to third parties that's the only way right now um and i'd say for good reason to be able to show proof to your co customers to your shareholders to your board to management that you have best practices in place and that you are legitimate <laughs> So, you know, finally, let's look at this roadmap to success. And for folks that might be familiar with an ISO certification scheme uh, or have gone through the GMP process, um, this, this may be familiar. It's called plan, do, check, and act. So start by planning, right? Establish a baseline. Identify your priorities. Again, from a business, a company standpoint, what are your values? What is your goal? What's your final product? What do you want to achieve? <laughs> Identify those goals and establish a baseline. You need data, right? Even the most fundamental data of you know, your output per gram or you know, output you know, kilowatt per gram, <clears throat> something like that. Start with your baseline. Then go ahead and implement it, right? Make sure you have a plan to achieve those goals. How are you going to measure it? How are you going to monitor it? Uh, what processes are in place to actually allow you to get to that level of rep reproducibility? And then check it, right? Again, this is just like your SOPs. This is a living system. Um, just like the 1995 Ford Taurus looks nothing like the 2019 Ford Taurus or you know the latest Ford vehicle, um, you don't want your operation today to look the same it does five years from now. Check and improve. Monitor, measure it, document your results, identify the issues and find opportunities for improvement and fix them. <laughs> and then act, right? Evaluate evaluate kind of that that post hoc uh, after you know after after the fact do that SWOT analysis evaluate how effective these were and implement your lessons learned so that you can do it all over again and this is really the fundamental process and roadmap for success <laughs> so that said I think we covered a lot I hope you guys all enjoyed and, and got something from this um, what are the takeaways if we were to boil this down uh, the last 40 minutes between Brett and I Start early. It's never too late, but you know, start today. Start yesterday. Start start soon. Audit often. Go in there, just like you know, your taxes, your financial statements. You always have a third party come in and audit those. Um, you want to audit often. You want to have impartiality and you want a fresh perspective on where things are going and where things are not going well so that you can improve. <laughs> Recognize that GMPs really protect your business. Um, these are best practices. Take the buzzword, throw away GMP for a second, and you know, look at the PJRF site, you know, cannabis safety standard. This is about safety and consistent products, and that's all GMPs are there for. Um, this works on a global scale, as we saw earlier, right? From food to herbs and spices to pharma and medical devices. This is what allows the global economy to run and allows businesses to provide peace of mind that when our you know cantaloupe comes from Central America that it's safe and not going to poison us the same thing applies for cannabis um, third-party certification is the vehicle to give you that confidence um, both you your team and your external stakeholders from your customers clients patients to board members it it's the best way to instill confidence and you know finally this is all about repeatable quality by design so you start early you audit often you follow that plan do check act and you design quality into your entire life cycle and it's just the way of doing life as a business and it allows you to be consistent and you know uh, scalable <laughs> so i hope that was helpful for everybody um <clears throat> Uh, the final slide here, I want to thank everybody for joining. I'll turn it back to Brett and uh, perhaps we have any if we have any questions from the audience. Now would be a great time to pop those into your, uh, I believe there's a question chat or screen there. And um, you know, I'll leave you guys with this quote that I really like from one of the fathers of quality, um, uh, Dr. Deming. You know, it is not necessary to change. Survival is certainly not mandatory. So, um, Thank you for all that, Brett. Great, David. Thank you. 
a amazing presentation and I hope it was um, uh, insightful for everybody who attended. Um, I think we had one last poll question and we can also check uh, if there's any questions from the audience here. One thing we didn't really go over, get a question about, which maybe you can have some input on too, David, is, you know, what actually happens during a GMP audit? You know, what is the flow? And as a certification body, typically for most folks out there, uh, a lot of the cannabis and hemp GMP audits that we've done typically are about, on average, a day and a half to two days long. Uh, in the food world or a bigger manufacturing facility obviously it might might be more than that uh typically there is an opening meeting with all the you know major managers and players uh and on day one the a lot of the documentation is going to be reviewed and then towards the end of the first day and into the second day if needed you know the actual facility and the actual gmp portion the, the physical part if you will um is reviewed and then at the end of the process, there will be a closing meeting where whatever shortcomings there are, which are called corrective actions, uh, you would receive that as a report. And typically those corrective actions would be answered in writing. It wouldn't necessarily need a, a return visit from the auditor. And as a certification body, once we have the co corrective actions in place and those have been marked as acceptable, uh, then the certificate is issued to you, you're up and running, and that is renewed uh, annually. And as David had mentioned, at some point during that year, you're going to want to do an internal audit of yourself to constantly be checking your quality and, and to make sure where things are at. Um, David, I, I had a question for you. What, sure. you know, when, when, you're, when you're consulting for folks and, you, and, you're, and you're visiting, what what kind of walk through things do you look for? What what are kind of triggers that tell you, okay, they've got it together, or they don't have it together? What what are some some quick things that you kind of notice off the bat sometimes? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Brett. Um, and the one thing I'll add too before I I, I, I answer it is to add to your uh, comment or your your statement about you know how this process works on site is you know we as auditors when we're coming in when I've got my audit add on we're looking for conformance. Uh, that's what you know. Auditors are trained to do, and we're there to look to you guys to say, "Hey, prove to me that you have your ducks in a row." I'm not here to, you know, peek under and look in the corners, and you know, like that happens as part of the process. We have to ask questions, but we're here just to look for evidence that you're following those best practices. Um, and to your point, uh, Brett, you know, some of the things that I see and my team looks for is, you know. Just the energy in the room to start with. Um, are folks wearing consistent PPE? If somebody's wearing gloves and a, you know a hairnet, and then somebody's walking around that same area handling equipment without gloves on, you know that's that's a red flag. Um, looking for labels. You know, are things clearly organized and labeled? If uh, you know there's something in a fume hood that's just open and there's some sort of liquid in there. <coughs> Um, that tells me that they perhaps are not very organized in terms of documentation traceability. So uh, those are a couple of the like first things that, that kind of, you know, once you walk into a facility become very obvious um, um, whether folk, where folks are at and how organized they are. Good. Well, uh, at some point in every webinar, it's, it's time to, <laughs> to call an end to it. It actually looks um, like, just, to, like, just to jump in, we do have two questions from the audience. I'll go ahead and read them off for you guys. If great. You respond. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Jeffrey. Uh, his question is, is there a list of quote unquote typical equipment that would need to be qualified, calibrated and or certified from a third party? Um, I know scales and cannabis in some states are required, but not much else. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can I can take that, um, <clears throat> or at least start with that. So there's not a there's not a hard and fast yes or no this, but not that. <clears throat> um, scales. Look at it this way. <clears throat> to ask yourself the question, Jeff, and to the rest of the folks out there: <clears throat> Do I need to get some sort of precision data out of that equipment? Or another way to look at it is: Does it have a significant and direct impact <clears throat> on the quality of my product? <clears throat> And if the answer is yes, 
it needs to be qualified and calibrated to some level. Um, you know, scales are an obvious one in terms of having calibration, being able to trace it back to you know a NIST traceable weight, because you know, I think about your speedometer in your car. Um, your car may actually be off by a couple of you know miles per hour, depending on all sorts of factors. If it was off by 10 to 15 miles an hour, and you got pulled over by the cop, or you know, say the cop's um, radar detector or radar, you know, laser was off, you want to make sure that's calibrated and that's precise. <laughs> if they say you're going 70 and you're going and your speedometer says 60, that's a problem. You need to make sure that that's standardized. Um, in terms of other equipment, though, you know, looking at there, there needs to be some level of qualification. So, you know, as simple as Installation qualification of, say, your extractor um, or, you know, a pneumatic pump, <clears throat> making sure that you have the spare parts in, in order, making sure that you verify that it actually works consistently. Um, it, the answer really should be all equipment needs to be qualified. The degree of qualification, say, on the calibration side, may differ depending on the complexity of the instrument. So I hope that that helps. Yeah, that's a great answer. It's very comprehensive. Um, we have two questions from Mason. I'll uh, I'll separate these into two parts. Um, the first question: um, All businesses and facilities are different. How do you approach complicated or unique <laughs> issues that arise during the audit process? That's the first part of the question. Oh, you're asking for my magic sauce of how I make judgment decisions on the fly. Still, that are still all consistent. your secrets, David. <laughs> Um, no, you're absolutely right. Every business and facility is different, and you know that's part of why when you actually read these GMP standards, some a lot of folks call me and say, "Oh, these are horrible. They're so intent. They're so vague. Like, how am I supposed to follow this?" And they are vague. They're intentionally vague because you get to come up creatively with how you're going to demonstrate conformance to them. Um, so you know if. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert, like for example, on the cultivation side, I have a black thumb. I let everybody know that. I do not know how to grow, you know, <clears throat> I've got a couple of little kind of uh, succulents here because those are really easy to keep alive, but I don't know how to grow cannabis. <clears throat> Never tried, I'd probably fail epically, even though it's a weed. Um, it's supposed to be easy. So I don't look at that, but I look at the paperwork and say, are you showing, you know, what do you have in place to show that you're doing this consistently and that your product is, is safe at the end of the day? Um, so I ask, it's really just about asking questions back to the standard and um, you know, making sure that you come off with an answer that makes sense to me. And if it doesn't make sense, I may probe more, but essentially it's up to you guys. You guys are the experts, not us. So regardless of how complicated it is, um, it really comes back to, do you have an answer? The onus is on you to um, show me how that complicated thing meets the requirement. That's a great industry insight there, David. Um, <laughs> thanks for spilling all your secrets. Um, we've got the second part of uh, Mason's question. Um, when a business moves to a new location, is it necessary to have an auditor come to the new facility or would photos be sufficient? Yeah, um, unless I'm missing something, Brett, that would be a definite yes, an auditor would come to the new facility. Um, you want to think about your, you know, when you bring on a new facility, um, that's a whole new operation. You've got new man, new manpower, most likely, perhaps new equipment, or at least the the equipment is configured in a different way. Um, you know, even from as simple as the power grid coming in might be different and the water is different. So from that perspective, it, it's a new audit, it's a new certification uh, in many regards. Great. Okay. Exactly. If I could also, <laughs> if I could chime in on that too, Amy, which we've, we've had this happen quite a few times with uh, producers, um, extractors outgrowing their space or a laboratory moving to a new location. Like David mentioned before, this is part of your plan. It's part of your operation. Um, you know, when do you have to leave your old location? When do you have to move in? Can you operate both at the same time? And plan ahead so that you don't leave yourself open for waiting for that new audit or that new review to happen. But unfortunately, the the photographs um, would not be acceptable. So at, at some point, um, the certification body is going to have to to see everything either virtually or in person to, to validate what's happened at the new location. 
Yeah, the one, I'll just jump in one extra time here. Um, <clears throat> think of it as an opportunity to show off of how much you've improved. Um, you most likely are not using all the same equipment. You're going to be implementing some new practices. A new facility is an opportunity because you've outgrown uh, most likely, or you, you know, you learn from some of the mistakes and you don't want to implement all the same things. So um, for that reason, there's enough change that you want somebody to come in and recertify you with your new and improved system. Great, thanks for the input, both of you. Um, we have another question that just came in from uh, Ferris. Uh, the question is, how is the GMP audit that PGR would weigh against GFSI audits? Would the coverage of the GMP audit cover, say, 20% of a full GFSI? Um, I think it, the question is phrased in terms of how would a GMP audit compare to a GFSI audit in terms of coverage? That's a great question. I don't have a specific percentage on that, but I'm going to definitely figure that out after this webinar. Okay. Uh, a GM, uh, yeah, but what I can say, and I think David could also chime in on this too, is that you know a GMP audit, although valuable and important, uh, is more of an overall uh, view of the entire process, of the entire manufacturing process, if you will. A GFSI is going to be more robust because it also includes portions of HACCP, direct food safety, and is a much more comprehensive checklist. So um, after this call, I can follow up with the, uh, with the question, and you can compare the two checklists, and I think that's really going to be your best way to kind of have a, have a gut check of, of what the differences between the two are. And David, if you had some input on this, I would defer to you also. Sure, yeah, I, um, I think what you said is, is really on point. Um, I'm hesitant to use the word GMP light, but um, you know, when you look at how where, where we explained it earlier, this is essentially modeled after part 117, um, part B, and that is a critical component of GFSI. So to the, to the, stamp, to the answer, say a question of, are you kind of having to re redo things or duplicate things? No, this sets you up for success for GFSI, but it does not get you all the way there. And I found that a lot of cannabis places, you know, we, we need to meet you guys where you're at. And when you're coming from, you know, the start of what the state requires to GFSI, that's a sizable leap. Um, so you got to start somewhere and getting to, uh, you know, a Perry Johnson certification gets you on the right tracks towards a GFSI scheme if that's your ultimate goal. And it gets you, you know, it sets you up with the fundamentals. Great. Yeah. No, if there are any questions, um, as you can see on the screen, there are some contact emails. Um, if you have specific questions um, directly regarding uh, your unique circumstance or something that maybe wasn't covered uh, in the presentation fully but was mentioned uh, as a side note, please feel free to drop us a line. Um, PeterFSI at PeterFSI.com is uh, the direct line and we can connect you to pretty much anyone. So if you wanted to speak to Brett, we can get Brett a message through there. And then if you wanted to reach uh, David directly, info at gmpcollective.com is gonna be your best bet for email contact. Um, it looks like we do have one question also from um, Joffrey here. Um, can you talk about the type of products being accepted and sold uh, in retail? Most if not all grocery stores are not accepting inhaled type CBD products, only topicals. And I think Brett, that would be pretty up your alley of late. Yeah, so this is a um, growing question that's that's been coming down because a lot of the bigger uh, change in stores are starting to carry um, hemp-based products. And so it seems, in my experience so far, that what we're seeing is that it's uh, definitely hemp seed and hemp oil. And then also uh, we have been seeing some CBD products for potions, uh, gummies, things of that nature, but definitely not, um, we haven't seen much in the way of, you know, additional vapes or, or things of that nature. So I know that's kind of a general answer, but the bigger grocery store chains and through one of the uh, industry groups called GRMA, um, I believe they're starting to put standards in place and requirements for exactly what those products are. 
and David, if you've had any input on this or maybe what's happened in Europe or other uh, countries for how they accept those products, that might be a good insight. Yeah, I mean, you definitely, let's see, I don't want to just duplicate what you just said, but I'll try to, if I can add, um, a lot of what we see and why what Brett just said is the case today is because of a lack of you know, supplier qualification. So I definitely don't see vaporizers becoming, you know, something you'll see in Trader Joe's or even, you know, your local grocery store or dollar store in the next you know, year or three. But you know, in terms of, you know, tinctures and edibles that are, again, CBD-based, um, if folks can meet those requirements, uh, whether it's through the GRMA, and again, going back to a GMP certification through Perry Johnson is the perfect way to start to show that you're on your path towards meeting specifications uh, from an independent third party, is uh, what's lacking right now and preventing a lot of folks from being able to um, put, their sell, uh, put their products on the store shelves. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, yeah. It looks like that was our last question that had come into the question box. Um, the one question we didn't get that we normally get that I'll just clarify for everyone, um, this session has been recorded. Uh, so if you'd like to review it, you know, you missed a couple slides at the beginning or you just wanted to double check, um, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you just go to pjrfsi.com, up at the top next to the Facebook icon, there should be a YouTube icon. And if you click through that, it will take you directly to our YouTube channel. We'd love for you to subscribe. Uh, we post all the recordings of all of our webinars, as well as some uh, informational and introductory type videos regarding all the different standards and programs we have. Um, and we do still absolutely, as I mentioned before, we want to hear from you. If you have suggestions about different webinar topics you'd like to see in the future, or even questions about you know standards that may not have even been mentioned here, we'd love to hear from you. So please just you know reach out, shoot us an email. Um, our phone number is uh, 248-519-2523 as well, if you'd rather uh, give us a call. And I think if we're all done with uh, questions, we can go ahead and wrap up the session. I wanna thank um, David especially for taking the time. I'm sure everyone's really busy of late with all the hectic, uh, you know, what's going on with audits if we're all in quarantine and all of those <laughs> questions. And thank you, Brett, and uh, for helping organize this whole thing. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you in other webinars. Yeah, thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you, Amy, for helping behind the scenes. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And I hope everyone has a great day. Um, and we'll see you all in the next webinar. Bye.